can't, I don't ever start any lecture on SFA and I'm sure Srini and the rest of his team has given you guys this picture, but this is our, this is our SFA godfather. This is our Kerfield Bachelor godfather, Dr. Dotter. Um, this is the first ever turf war. This is something you guys hear about, you deal with. This is the first ever order for the angiogram. It says visualize, but don't fix it. That's from the surgeon. So the turf wars existed way back then. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, just like we all do, we can't listen to that kind of crap. Here's the SFA on this patient, the first ever peripheral intervention that was done endovascularly. And this is the lesion in the SFA pop post angioplasty or post dilation, because at that time there was no balloon catheters and all that. That simple area was fixed. And the patient who was an elderly patient with non-healing wound progressed to healing. Uh, she died a few years later uh, from other reasons, but this was the actual first ever intervention percutaneously of an SFA, which resulted in wound healing. So we've come a long way, but we haven't really figured everything out yet. So why is the SFA so problematic? Why do we have to have talks on just one area of the arteries when there's so many areas we have to work on? That's because the severity of symptoms dictate what do we do? There's always that question of, do you intervene on a claudicant? Uh, what should you do? Should we bypass just medical therapy? Everyone loves to say medical optimization, which for most patients doesn't mean much because they want something done, which you have to learn how to temper that and say, no, we're going to try something first. But uh, whether you're going to intervene or not, then the question of bypass does exist. You have to think about that. Does it, is a patient young enough? Do they have good veins for a long CTO or for a long segment of disease? You should consider that. You should do a vein mapping uh, for these patients. So you have to be aware of that. The worst thing you ever do is convert a claudicant into a CLI patient by causing a complication, which happens more often than you think, especially with other specialists who don't have such good focus on the imaging part of it but you don't want that situation to happen. Long segments of SFA disease pose a problem of what is the best uh, intervention. If it's an older patient, it's okay. You're gonna re-intervene and that's okay. But if you have a 40-year-old, 45-year-old, 50-year-old, you worry about, you know, is the bypass better here? But we have better tools and technology that are helping us get to that point. And the biggest Achilles heel is usually heavy, heavy calcific burden. Uh, for me now, when we talk about usual setup, I wouldn't say everything's usual, but I have my own approaches for almost all my patients, at least at the minimum, which my techs and nurses know and my trainees as they work with me know. Uh, it's usually almost always a six or seven French braided sheath. Now, why six or seven? If it's a, if it's a regular case or probably a diagnostic case where I'm gonna do something small, I'm gonna use a six French. It's not a big difference in size there, but why not go bigger when you don't need to? If there's disease in the proximal SFA, I'm gonna go with a shorter 45 centimeter sheath. If it's anything beyond the SFA, the proximal SFA is okay, then I go with a 70 centimeter sheath or longer. The reason being the longer your sheath is, the closer you are to the lesion, the better support you get. Now, that being said, uh, at the same time, I do like anti-grade access. That means sticking that same groin that has the disease and going down the leg instead of up and over. Usually this is predicated that you already have seen the inflow or you have imaging saying everything's okay on the inflow physical exam wise. But that anagrade goes along with that same theory of the shorter the distance to the lesion that you're working with, the better support and the better success you may have. Um, for these things, I don't flip the patient head to toe or, and I don't stand on the opposite side now. I actually stand on the same side I would have if I was going up and over. And then I pull, I have the sheath extended on the groin a little, a few centimeters. And I'll show you a picture of that. And that's because then my sheath and all my equipment lay on the patient's body, which I have sterile rather than off to the side and it makes it difficult um, to keep it sterile or just kind of equipment wise. Uh, if I'm going anagrade, usually my axis wire is a nitrix wire. It just has quite a bit of support with a small um, shapeable tip and it helps it curve and select the SFA. You can do this under ultrasound. You can see the SFA and profunda and you can actually curve the wire anterior, which is the way the SFA goes and have a better shot of going in there. Um, and then I'll show you a flipping technique where if you want to do everything from one groin, you can go up as if you're going up and over, do your initial angiogram, and then you can flip your axis and go back down that leg to do your treatment. For most cases, it's an 035, 038 system, uh, angled Berenstein catheter, and then I go down to a four French glide catheter for many things. After uh, the initial axis wire, I have a stiff glide or a stiff amplatz, usually an amplatz first, just to test the lesion. And I'll show you that down at the end of the cases of why that helps, stiff glide or soft glide. And then as we're going for the SFA pop, it's usually all, I decrease down to an 018 system uh, with a four French glide catheter or a quick cross, which is a support catheter. And then the wire de-escalation or escalation, depending on what I'm dealing with, heavy calcium versus 
just a CTO. This is the anagrade approach I was telling you. So usually you want to access, just like you would for up and over, you want to access in the mid to lower third of the femoral head. And for me, I, I access from while I'm standing on this side of the patient and I'll bring my sheath this way. So everything's draped across the patient's body. I can access everything. My imaging is on this side. So I can still see everything, access everything. I'm not having my hands in the, the field. And uh, that's just the way I like it. Now, in terms of if you want to do everything from one side, this is the access uh, for a patient going and we check the aorta iliac system on the right side. Now there's disease in the SFA. So the goal is how do we uh, do the rest of it. So this is what you're seeing is a reverse curve catheter, be it omni flesh or other catheter. And I'm bringing it down with a glide wire and watching the glide wire go down the SFA. Once I have the wire down the SFA, then what you can do is pull your sheath out and then with a the dilator in redirect it down the SFA. And you'll see that this is a guiding catheter helping us flip back down and then we'll get our sheath down. So that's the flipping technique. It's a straightforward thing as long as you don't lose access and you're able to get down there. It's very simple. So when you get into disease, you always look at the native image. Be very mindful of that with a scout image. You'll see some calcific burden. It kind of helps you think about what you're going to run into. When I see this picture on the right, it's a little bit of harrowing in my head. I'm like, what we're we about to run into. So when we talk about these lesions, we talked about why SFA in general is why a little difficult. Why are calcified lesions very difficult? And that's being that the reason because uh, it's hard to stay in the lumen of the vessel when there's heavy calcium, especially if there's an occlusion and it's very calcified. In those calcified rocks, you can feel the wire, you can feel your device is just hitting this crunchy area and you know that's gonna be very difficult. Um, and often you're not gonna be luminal in your course. And in the beginning, it's hard to appreciate that it's okay. But in general, we all know this, Dr. Tamala knows this, it's totally fine to be subminimal. Actually, it's helpful in many situations such as heavy calcium. Uh, the question is, can you get back into a normal lumen beyond that area and that's the key. And there's many things I'll show you in a couple of cases why that matters. We have a lot of tools and uh, wires and support catheters, re-entry devices uh, when you're dealing with heavy calcium and also safari or what we like to say pedal access, retrograde access, because a lot of times you can't get from above into a lumen. OCT is kind of a device where it helps you see through the lesion uh, with optical coherence. Uh, can you predict that calcium and what you're going to deal with? And you sort of can when you look at non-invasive. You can see that heavy calcified cap here. Here's with color flow. And on an angio, you can see that rounded cap. So you can predict what's going to happen because they've come up with uh, some classifications of this. You can correlate your non-invasives with your angiogram and it helps us reduce radiation because we know, I don't think I'm going to have success going this direction or this route because there's this whole theory of the CTOP classification with one of our friends, uh, Fadi Saab, who him and Jihad Mustafa had come up with this classification after looking at tons of occlusions. And what they found is that those occlusions have convex or concave top and bottom proximal distal areas that you have to get through. And the way that shape may predict uh, your success. So if they're both in this direction, it's easier for the wire to go straight down. However, if they're mixed, it's gonna start going subminimal when you get to that, the curved part. Same thing as you see here in the type three and type four. Now, none of us sit there and Classify, it just explains to you why your wire bias, whether it's luminal or subminimal, and which way you may want to approach your patient. Now, subminimal, um, it's a little scary when you're young in the training program, you start wire going all these places, like, oh my God, I'm not in the lumen. Uh, but you have to understand where it is first. So, this is that subintimal space just below the actual lumen. And when you look at it here, it's okay because we cross lesions here. You can see. The wire goes into this subminimal space. The key is that you have to pop back in and you want to pop back in, whatever your method is, back into the earliest area of normal lumen. That's kind of how you uh, keep your flow going into the normal artery. How do you know you're subminimal? This is kind of when you see your uh, wire going, this is where the artery should be. And you see this is a 018 wire with a support catheter. You can see the wire going in this wavy pattern. That's not in the lumen, no matter what you say. You can see this curvy pattern here. That's subintimal. That's how you know. When your wire makes a loop or it starts making it squigglies and it's going in these curves, it's not luminal. But as long as distally, as you see here, it starts popping back into lumen, that's good. Also note that there's a loop in the wire. If you're moving the wire through your occlusion and that loop starts getting bigger and bigger, stop. Because you're getting into a huge, large subintimal space or you may be going extravascular. So you want, if a small, tight loop is totally okay, it actually helps you in a lot of occlusions. But if it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then you got a problem.
So if you're in the subminimal space and you can't cross luminal with your wiring catheter, what do you do next? We have tools which are such as re-entry devices. This one is in particular is called the Outback device. It's a six French device. You can see the uh, DSA roadmap here. Here's the original native image. Here's the roadmap that you can keep live. And what we're doing here is this device, you have a trigger with little needle that pops out. And if you direct it at the artery and, you're, and you succeed, you can pop your wire in. This is an 014 wire into the lumen. You take out the device. Now you've passed from lumen through subminimal through lumen, and now you can do your uh, intervention. So once you get into the true lumen, you do your injections and you decide whatever you're going to do, whether it be just ballooning um, or you're going to be putting a scaffold in there. In this case, it's a bare metal self-expanding stent. Um, and then you go on to your case. Now, how do you predict some of these things? When you look at a single image and I see this, and I think I showed this earlier, it brings in a lot of uh, nausea, or like, you know, just GERD in your body. You're like, oh, this is going to be a little bit of a rough one. But just looking at that native image, it might affect how I'm gonna, what kind of tools I'm going to already ask for. Uh, some people prefer IVIS, intravascular ultrasound, uh, to kind of see where the calcium is. Is it intraluminal? Is it all peripheral? Uh, how would that affect my atherectomy choice? What are the modes of failure? Is it going to be, if I can't stay luminal, am I going to go subminimal throughout this entire thing? Where do I have to reenter? Do I have to go from the foot? And also, should you vein map this patient or did you vein map? That might be a good thing to consider. If they're a young patient or healthy, you may want to consider if they have a native GSV, whether they can get a good bypass, which may be better for them. The IVIS gives us information on the inside of the vessel, uh, how much disease burden there is, how tight it is in those areas, because just because there's calcium does not mean that there's stenosis that's significant. But IVIS will really kind of tell you how narrow that lumen is and really give you more information. I don't use it in every one of my cases. I'd say 50%-ish of my cases, I'll use it. Why exactly every time? I can't predict to you. Um, when I feel I need it, I use it. It's always available. Um, it's expensive, but it's a, it's a great tool to make us better at what we're doing. Now, in terms of atherectomy for these patients, why plaque modification? Uh, the reason being because when you modify the vessel before your final treatments, especially pre-ballooning, you get less significant dissections. Nothing you do prevents dissections in a balloon. Every balloon causes dissections. But the goal is to use less pressure in the balloon, causing less trauma. Um, and that may give you a better longevity and less perforations and other complications. And also it's satisfying mentally when you think you're preparing the vessel, if you're going to do drug eluding or scaffolding, you really want to get that caliber of the lumen to be as normal as possible. And IVIS can help you see if you got that caliber. Remember when you do an angiogram on floral, that's a 2d image. So IVIS gives you that 3d representation.